is the founder and CEO of Tough Africa, Ambassador Jake Epele, who joins us to share his thoughts as we look to get more analysis and insights. Hello, good morning to you, Mr. Jake. How are you doing? Good morning. Uh, good to be here. Now, this is one of the most contentious conversations following an off cycle election. And over time, persons have looked at the conduct of off cycle elections as being relatively more credible than general elections in Nigeria. Is this position sway coming as much of a concern to you? Um, you're right. But this time around, I think this is uh, one of the... Um, it's almost a reflection of 2023. Um, I like to look at it from three perspectives. Uh, one is, is the process. Um, the INEC and all the uh, stakeholders, did they follow the process? Uh, the second is the provision. The provision of the Electoral Act and the provision of the electoral resources by uh, INEC. Was that the case? And then thirdly uh, is performance. Uh, what was the performance of INEC in general? Um, but I think by way of opening statement, I, I will say that um, it, this election uh, featured a lot of rigging, a lot of vote buying, and uh, voter uh, apathy. It's unfortunate that the political class and some iota of the blame goes to the electoral umpire, and this time INEC. Um, it's also disheartening that with all the efforts that we have been making and all the strides that we have been making, that the political class have decided to frustrate democratic process. Um, Ambassador, let's when look at some of these frustrations like you're highlighting so that we carry our viewers along as well. Because over time, persons have talked about the role of political actors, particularly ahead of the elections. Now, we'll start with the Edo uh, situation as a case study. Even as regards the signing of the peace accord, the PDP jettisoned the process. Now, looking at it in an afterthought, out of over 2.6 million voters in Edo, there's been widespread voter apathy. Accredited mm -hmm. voters, just about 500,000 plus. Mm -hmm. And uh, many are saying that th that refusal to sign the accord somehow frightened voters from turning out. I, I, I well, I mean, I don't, I don't think so. Um, it might somewhat, somehow contributed to it, might have contributed to it, but is, it, it cannot uh, be solely blamed on their refusal to sign the peace accord, which is uh, not acceptable on the part of PDP. However, um, the issue of voter apathy is traceable to uh, lack of trust by the citizens. You know, um, I thought that this election would have been one of the things that uh, one of the election that INEC would have used to instill confidence or buy back confidence uh, of the citizens in the process, but it failed. So it is not necessarily because they didn't sign the peace accord. Um, this election was a, a bit, uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, non-violent, non you know. So there was no major insecurity issues. There was no major security breaches. Um, however, voter party stemmed uh, from one, lack of effective strategic voter education. Two, um, the discontent of electorate that feels that whether they vote or not, their vote will not count. You know? Three, the economic situation you know, the economic situation in the country, uh, people are just tired and focusing on how they can put food on their table. 
Um, I think the third factor uh, I, I talked about insecurity. Uh, the, the third factor is the political gladiators that scares uh, the hell out of people, you know. And so the, these are major factors as, as, as a stakeholder, as one that was in the field. Uh, these are the major factors. And of course, uh, you can't take away the fact that the deployment of electoral resources uh, did not get to the polling you, you, booths or polling stations on time. So people may go there, get frustrated, and leave, and never voted. You know. So these are some of the um, uh, contributing factors to voter apathy. Uh, but it was very disappointing um, how this election was managed and, um, of course, how the process were violated uh, and the fact that um, there's a deliberate effort on the part of uh, politicians. And please mark my word, I'm not singling out any political party. I'm just telling you in general terms, you know, uh, all of them are responsible for what is happening in the political space. All of them, especially the two big political parties, APC and PDP. Uh, they are responsible for, for, for what is going on currently. And, and it's, it's very disappointing to see that these individuals and institutions have worked tirelessly to build what we would describe today as a mega political system in Africa. And yet they are folding their hands, watching it destroyed. It's like building a house and you decide to destroy the same house you built. It's, it's not acceptable. Now, Ambassador Jake, this position you have reiterated is also shared by 25 observer groups who partook in the Edo elections. And uh, despite no cases of violence, recorded this uh, out wide outrage uh, on the way the result might have been manipulated in some quarters has also been documented by 25 of these observer groups. In, in moving forward, do you think that these recommendations on the part of the electoral umpire would take more of a seat-up position to addressing them ahead of the polls in Ondo come November? Yes, we are, we are particularly concerned. I, I mean, I, I, my organization is part of the um, uh, Civil Society uh, Collective uh, Report um, indicting the process uh, and the provision and, and the, perform the overall performance. Um, yes, uh, I hope that um, INEC and the REC in uh, on the, uh, is listening, and there are a huge lesson that have been learned. Um, whether they would apply the outcome of those lessons is something that we need to start writing home about. You know, how, however, there is a need to totally overhaul the electoral system. I know we've been doing reforms upon reforms, uh, reports upon reports, but there's a need to sit down to totally overhaul the electoral system. If I were the president, um, this is the time for him to be the true Democrat that we have always known him to be. Um, the electoral system is in jeopardy and it needs to be totally restructured, refocused, are re strategized. All right, uh, Ambassador Jake, also joining us now and virtually, we also have the governance manager of Action Aid Nigeria, Ms. Judith Bagidi, who joins us virtually as well. So, would we'll also be going between yourself and herself so we can have a more robust dialogue. Hello, Ms. Bagidi. Good morning to you. Can you hear us? Hi, good morning. Can you hear me? Very well. Thanks for joining us. Uh, very quickly, let's Thank get you. into comments and pick up from where Ambassador Jake left off. He's hopeful that INEC will take a cue from the recommendations made following the outcome of the Edo elections and discrepancies noticed. But before you make your thoughts, let's also accommodate uh, the position of former president, Dr. Goodluck Jonathan, who says that the Edo elections 
is a reflection that technology cannot fix our electoral process. Does this comment come as a shock to you? Do you align your thoughts with him? Do you disagree? Let's have your position. Um, okay, so I think I'll pick it up from where Ambassador Jake um, left it. Um, he had mentioned, um, talking about the complete overhaul of, um, of INEC itself. Um, and we know that this has been oncoming from the period of um, from the from 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 the period of the um, former vice president, who is um, Yaradua himself. Um, there have been conversations around. Um, currently, we currently have conversations around electoral reform, where they are looking at the electoral act. But I think that what we really need to look at is. Um, the several provisions that can guarantee free and fair election and to ensure that what is fundamentally flawed um, is not really the, the reform itself, but also the management of the body itself. Um, so what I would say is that um, from, if you look at the former chief of um, justice, which is um, Weiss himself, he had made provisions from um, the constitution that Yeradua himself had 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 made after the um, five to four majority narrow where, where he was gracious enough to concede that the election that brought him to power was very flawed. And if we remember very well, if we look back at time, we would see that um, he had um, scholars who he set up in the committee. For example, you have people like um, um, Bolaji, um, INE, and and then the former chief of um, justice, which is um, um, Weiss himself, and also religious leaders in that committee. And one of the things that they said was to reconstitute the electoral management body. And they had mentioned that this should be done in two forms, which is the appointment of the chairman and the deputy chairman. Um, there should be, um, it shouldn't be, rec it shouldn't be brought in, it shouldn't be an elected position, but rather it should be a bidding process whereby the NJC would advertise for people and then candidates who are competent can actually come in and also, you know, vote. And you know, when you do something like this, you have the, the process whereby they are looking at your character and then your demonstrated competence will be able to see that yes we can do this and then um, it's a free and fair um, aspect whereby we know that nobody is loyal to anybody so um yes i stand with ambassador jake in that aspect so that we don't just have an appointed um, um committee but what do we have we have one that is voted there is an accountability process where they are voted in but not just left for um, one person to nominate and then because if you nominate me then I am loyal to you it simply means that I am not independent of you at that point in time so um, I think that that really really broadens a lot of things if we look back at that um, report we'll see that it has a lot um, about two major recommendations that we as Nigerians can pick from itself well, thanks, Ms. Begidi, for aligning your thoughts with Ambassador Jake. I'll come back to you, Ambassador Jake, at this moment. And I'll still throw the same question I threw to Ms. Begidi back to you. Comments made by uh, former President Dr. Goodluck Jonathan as it regards our electoral challenges. Many were hoping that technology at some point, introduction of Beavers, IREV, would somehow fix some of the prominent issues in the electoral process. But do we think that uh, somewhat of the issues are more human factored than those needing to be solved by technology? I, I, I think, uh, my brother, you asked a question and you answered it beautifully well. Uh, <laughs> the problem is not technology. The problem is the people that operates the technology and, and runs with it. Um, I, there is no way you can dismiss the impact of technology in every facets of life, not just election. And so um, they, I mean, I have huge respect for the former president. Uh, and I think history has been very kind to him. But we cannot do without technology. Technology has come to stay. And electoral technology is the way to go. Um, I think I would like to weigh in on um, some of the presentation that my sister made. Uh, which is, um, uh, you see, 
it's important to look at the electoral management body. But when you fix in the electoral management body and <clears throat> you don't fix citizens, the political party, the security apparatus in an electoral <clears throat> situation, you will still have the flaws that we are having right now. <clears throat> when, when we talk about the call for a holistic uh, electoral reforms, we are saying a reforms that would touch on citizens' participation, uh, which speaks more to inclusivity, um, reforms that would touch on the electoral management body, reforms that would focus on the political party, reforms that focuses on the security agencies. You know, these are the strands of uh, processes that run a holistic election. The people, the management body, the political party, the security apparatus, even the media, you know. So a holistic um, electoral reforms will address every strand of the parts and parcel of the electoral, holistic electoral or organism that I have just mentioned, you know. So it's, it's a, it's a, there's a need for us to <clears throat> interrogate the entire electoral system. Now, I know the Orasoya report and, uh, well, not the Orasoya report, um, Justice, uh, um, I can't remember his name now, uh, the electoral reforms that he did. That is good, but don't forget that that reform was several years ago. There are emerging issues today. There are, in fact, when he did the report, the, the aspect of technology in the electoral process was not taking center stage, you know. So, so there are new things that have come out, emerging issues that we need to accommodate and do a revision of that report in order to bring issues, current issues, that would impact uh, today's electoral uh, organism and give us a, give us a strategic uh, and result-oriented process. You know, some of the problems we are going through even borders on the Electoral Act. There are loopholes uh, that some politicians deliberately allowed in the current Electoral Act that needs to be interrogated. Uh, that there are some clauses that needs to be uh, repair, uh, repealed and replaced with a better non-draconian laws. You know, and so th th this is the conversation, you know, the need for a holistic electoral reforms, which will also in turn address the issues that my sister raised, uh, the electoral management body. I believe that INEC is over bloated. There are too many responsible responsibility given to them that they are not able to discharge. You know, I believe, I, and I want to align with uh, her call, uh, 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 and I think what, in summary, what she was trying to say was the appointment of INEC chairman, you know, the appointment of the RICS, which is left in the hand of the president, a sitting president at the time, you know, and the current. Now, here's what happens. The president oftentimes, especially in Nigerian context, appoints with bias. Today we have, you know, it is alleged that some of the rigs are either APC card carrying member or PDP card carrying member. Ambassador Jacob, that, Ambassador. let's be very direct with that example because the wreck in the Edo elections was said to have been the cousin of the FCT minister. He came out to review that. This did not in any way influence his uh, appointment as wreck ahead of the Edo elections. In such case scenarios, how do we disassociate partisanship from your duty as a resident electoral commissioner in an election to be unbiased? Well, did you not see? I was in Edo myself. You understand? His body language 
shows bias. Period. You know, he's, he 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 literally was dancing towards the, um, the uh, one political party. You know, and you can't disassociate that. If I was in his shoes, I would have recused myself from from this service and go elsewhere. And I, I, if I was in the shoes of INEC chairman, I would have moved him to another state, you know. And we're having, I, I think there's also a feeler that we're getting from um, um, Ondo, that the Ondo, uh, the REC in Ondo, is a uh, APC card carrying member, you know. How long are we going to... And now, whilst we have some network glitch on the end so, of Ambassador Jake. Um, hello? Yeah, we, you can step in. We had some glitch on his end. Let's get your thoughts. Yes. So, um, so what I wanted to say, um, in line with um, what Ambassador Jake has mentioned, I know he was talking about in terms of equitable assets. And that's one of the things that we're looking out for in Action Aid Nigeria. If we look at our new country like, strategy uh, paper, we're looking at good governance in terms of equitable assets. Now, in terms of that, we're trying to see how do we actually ensure that the percentage of women, young people, and persons with disability, with their voices being heard in politics and good governance. That's something we're also looking at. But like he mentioned, when it comes to a situation whereby um, there's an issue of partisan, it's always um, better to, to come up and we call it at our end, we call it the conflict of interest, to just declare and then you step down, like he mentioned, then the person should be switched to a different state, like Ambassador just mentioned. You switch to a different state because there is no how, um, there will be a bit of an issue with um, interest there. When we know that this person is related to you, you'll be somehow tuned, even if um, we try to advocate more, but we are humans, we know how these things work. Um, there will be a bit of, of fine tuning to who um you are you, you are known especially to blood and all so um like ambassador jake mentioned um the first thing that should have been done was to have moved him out of the edo maybe probably push him to ondo and let him be there not in edo, in edo state no, no, i let's think um a... ambassador jake is back <laughs> yeah, uh... yeah, yeah. I, I mean i mean it's, it's 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 important to underscore uh one of the issues that he raised and i'm talking about the rake I hope you can hear me. Yes, sir, we can hear you. Yeah, yeah. It's important to underscore one of the issues that he raised. And any right-thinking person, the moment an individual starts sounding that way, you don't need an IQ of a mushroom to know that you have to move that individual. I mean, this guy came on a national television and said, oh, that he's under pressure, that they are trying to bribe him. That's enough for, for that individual to move one for his safety two for the integrity of the process three for 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 the integrity of the organization in this time i you know but he made those allegations you know and of course we saw what played out in edo it is unacceptable it is grossly absolutely unacceptable you know, and we can be making this effort. Better is the civil society, uh, and I think it's also time uh, for uh, the time has come for every time that an election comes and goes like this, we ask the both the umpire and everybody involved to give account of the expenditure. You 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 be uh, amazed to know how much they spent in just one. Of cycle election huge amount of money and yet the process the outcome is really nothing to write home about look at the level of voter apathy you have two point about 2.1 or 2.6 million uh, registered voters only less than 600 voted can you imagine the percentage of that that elected a sitting governor compared to the number of people that registered to vote in that state that in itself is i mean it calls for someone asking for somebody to resign you know when you cannot run 
a system like that creditably well and making sure that it's cost effective, then that, that fellow shouldn't be there. Now it's 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 disgraceful what happened. Now, care to make any comments, uh, Ms. Judith Bagidi, this issue of voter apathy, we spoke with uh, Ambassador Jake on the figures, over 2.6 million registered voters in Edo, but only about 570,000 were considered valid votes in the election per se. This widespread voter apathy, despite efforts from organizations like yourself in increased voter education, do you think that the electoral umpire on its own is doing enough in instilling the trust of voters in itself as an institution and in the process? Yeah, so I would say that um, with the way um, voter apathy keeps this very, really torn down, um, for registered voters, you had about 2.6 million for Edo State itself. And then out of the registered, for accredited, we have about only 604. Then if you look at the turnout, it's about 25.5. And that's really, really low. And then if you look at the total number of votes for Edo State itself was at 583,000, I think about 965%. And the ones that were invalid was about 13,000, which makes it about 570,000 um, valid votes. That's a low turnout from registered voters of 2.6 million and what's happening um normally we know that in nigeria when it comes to presidential election you have more numbers of people coming out then um it goes down in bits to governorship and then it's very very low at the point of local government elections but then there's an issue of um accountability transparency and trust once um people begin to see that the system really, really cannot be trusted. Um, the question now would be, is there a reason why I should come out again? That would always be the question. Um, so I think we've been having this issue for some time. And um, I think we also really need to work on on this, work on, on, on the trust of the people itself. If the people cannot trust on the system, it simply means we will not come out tomorrow to vote. So if we are having issue um, of vote buying, there's another issue that that's also affecting um, the voting system, which is um, you have the the, um, the vote buying itself. That's that's another huge one. So out of the few, the 20% 20, 20 of people that have come out, there's also a percentage of people who have sold their vote. And this has to do with the with the with the with the power holding um the 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 power of the people their expenditure power um i i think i've lost the word here but when i don't have that power um in terms of monetary values the economy is looking very very dwindled um i cannot um survive well people begin to think of now and not tomorrow they begin to see the need to actually start selling their votes at that point because the purchasing power is the word i was looking for, because their purchasing power at that point is already low so if my purchasing power is low i'm looking for anything to ensure that i can put food on the table if you look at um interviews with the other candidates you will see that they will tell you that even their people sold their votes why it's 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 tied to people's purchasing power the purchasing power is low and it's also tied to um civic education as, as well um, um ambassador jake had mentioned something about not just the complete overhaul of the management but also the people themselves so it's also tied to the civic education of the people they need to also understand that um it is their rights and it is not about now but it's about the future they also need to understand the power of um, equity itself to ensure that there's, there's equity in what we're doing. Um, so I think these are things that we can do to ensure that, um, to bring in um, people to actually come out to vote. Because out of 2 point something million people who registered and about 500,000 people who voted, who were accredited, not even voted, then it means that it's, it's going down by the day. And if we keep having a repeat of flawed elections people will keep losing trust on the system and people will keep 
refusing to come out to actually vote for who they want to vote because the question will be the last time i came 2023 i came i voted nothing 2025 i came i voted nothing so why 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 can't i stay back at home there's also the issue of security people are also looking at the issue of security in terms of coming out so am i safe when i come out to vote that's so, another angle to it now big questions you asked let's head over back to ambassador jake at this point in, in yes. terms of Edo being used as a litmus test ahead of uh, the off-second elections in Ondo, uh, what are some of the rejigs, so to say, that INE can take ahead of this to avoid another recurrence of voter apathy? Fantastic. I, I think I would, I would, I was carefully listening to uh, my sister from Action Aid, and uh, of, of course we partner with action action aid and thank you for the good work that you guys are doing especially in the disability space um let me just add, add i was carefully listening to her so that i don't sound repetitive um let me mention some of the aspects uh, she touched on uh but delve a little bit deeper voter education this time you cannot blame INEC. INEC is not the only institution responsible for voter education. Voter education is the primary, primary responsibility of civil society. So um, for our organization, I also take responsibility because we haven't done enough. Uh, and I'm sure that goes to Action Aid and every other person. Except we have not here. done enough. We, have, we need to do more. The people are not politically enlightened or electorally enlightened. And so they are not coming out, you know. So we need to do more. Weak institutions, weak institutions, whether it's political a party or the electoral management body or uh, the judiciary. When you have weak institutions, the trust of the people are eroded and they will never want to participate in the process. They don't believe that their vote will count. They don't believe that the court will help them to rescue uh, uh, injustice uh, in, the, in the process. You know, They don't believe that the people that they are electing, uh, they are going to elect, will do the needful. And so when the people are not properly educated to participate in a process, they look the other way. They just turn, turn, go back, you know. So we, we need to educate more. We need to make sure that our institutions are strengthened, you know, and democracy is deepened. Now, there are other factors. She touched on insecurity. Uh, for instance, my community, the moment there is insecurity rings a bell, Everybody will stay away. Is it me that, that cannot see properly in the sun, you know, uh, that you want me to go and risk my life? If, if there is a security breach, I, I, I am a, the first victim, you know? Um, um, the issue of uh, not deploying electoral resources when it's needed, and the people showing up and they don't see anybody, and they go away. INEC has a huge logistical problem, and they are refusing to address it. Now, on that ambassador, on that logistical problem, over time we've seen uh, private contractors being brought into the equation, despite the humongous amounts budgeted for to address this. In Edo, we also saw another attempt by the Nigerian Air Force to help expedite the process, airlifting sensitive materials early enough. But when it landed, the Edo state government said, school had been put on hold owing to the hike in pms and even for the private contractors they were asking for a review of existing contracts to accommodate this hike how does INEC look to address this logistical problem going forward look my my brother you 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 guys run a tv station if you give contract to a contractor and he don't it didn't deliver the first time you may and he may give excuses you probably will give him a chance the second time if you give him a chance the third time, that's absolute foolishness. You, you don't do that. There is nobody that runs business that will tolerate that. 
I've used it the first time, you disappoint. I got disappointed. Second time, I got disappointed. Why should I use you the third time? You know, you don't need uh, rocket science to know that that person will keep disappointing you, especially when he disappoints you. You don't get your money back. Nobody is arrested. Nothing happens to them. To them, is INEC has a big cake that everybody needs to cut and take their share and go away. These guys collect the money and disappear. Some of them show up when they want to show up. Others show up drunk. So how can you keep using the same people? They say it's only a madman that takes a stone, throws it in the air, put his head, and think it won't break his head. I think it's time for INEC to change their logistic contractors. You know, the kind of money and time that they spend with these incompetent people, if they put that resources together, they can pay some organization, I don't want to mention their name, Korea, private Korea entities can deliver these things faster and better. They have been proven, they have the track record, they have the transport system, they are not going to come back and give you excuses because they know if they don't deliver, they can be sued. But when you're dealing with association, association with multiple leader, leadership, association that you know has all kinds of fact, faction, this is what you're going to get. One of them will want to frustrate the effort to undermine the competencies of the other. So that's what has been happening. And INEC is not listening. I raised this same issue yesterday in a meeting. They need to do that as quickly as possible. You know, this time around in Edo, the beef has worked. They uploaded the results and contradicted themselves. I mean, there are too, much, too many problems, my brother, you know. So I, I think it's something we need to really, really, really interrogate and be honest to ourselves and be transparent in the outcome so that we don't keep making the same mistake. Well, well said, elections, elections are like business. I run an organization. If I'm not performing... I mean, my good friend Andrew in Action Aid, you know, if he's not doing what he's, he's called to do, leading well, the board will fire him. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. The board will fire him. You understand? So it's, it's you don't need the IQ of a mushroom to know that. You know, if I'm not doing what I'm doing and doing well, my board will fire me. You know, now, so, Ambassador Jake, we have five minutes to wrap this up. I'll come to you in a bit to just get your closing thoughts. Um, Let, let's cross over so to Ju Judith. Yes, Judith, please. Okay. Yeah, so I just wanted to jump in quickly on that. Like he has mentioned, if you have tried, um, if you're giving a contract out and you have tried times without number and it's not working, there's actually a need to to actually change um, the people that you are now working with. At Action Aid, we have done a previous um uh, it, there was a project that we had specifically for this where, where we called it N Logic, which is enhancing logistic delivery and citizens' participation in Nigeria's election. And if we look at it, we we sat down together with INEC and we developed an election logistic framework. And not just with them alone, but we brought in the transport together to ensure that this framework would. What, what we're able to do was to explain an effective process process that um, if this is done, we would, we would, we would stop all these um, delays in bringing in materials to elect to, um, to, 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 to polling units and all. Um, it's, it's, it cut across all. We, we monitored the election, even to the local government election in, um, in Enugu itself, which happened on the same day with Enugu, with uh, those it, um, gubernatorial elections and we saw the same trend they delay people were there and they were not able to vote why because the official materials had not arrived some materials arrived if we look at our statement some materials actually arrived at the hour of 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 3 30 from 4 p.m and when those materials arrived what happened um they had to start you know um 
they didn't do voters accreditation at that point what they did was because they were against time to just start issuing um Val issuing um votes and and that's automatically already beats the process itself um so we need to sit down back and look at what we are doing this process we have been doing is not working so what works should be the next question what works for us if we have been using a particular contracting um agency and sorry logistic agency and it's not working let's look out there like mentioned we all have a job description and if we are not delivering and um, bito you are here with us if you are not delivering on your work will you still be here tomorrow on the 9 a.m show to deliver uh, it's, not, it's not at all exactly it's it's but, but my sister look you have just raised a very important um point that we need to maybe maybe on your next show you need to bring both of us back hopefully my <laughs> my 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 my, my my postulation is that there is a need for everyone to invest the same amount of resources we're investing in the national election in the local election i believe that because we have not gotten it right at the local government that's why we're having problems at the national the sub-national is very important you know and that's why my attention have shifted and that's that's a good reminder, my, my sister. I'm going to call Andrew uh, after this show because my attention has shifted to local government. You know, how do we fix the local government election? That one is absolutely appalling. The governor <laughs> thinks he's the emperor. He grabs the neck of local government election and does whatever he likes. Now, Ambassador know? Jake, let's also factor in the electorate as well. Much like you're complaining about the roles of governors in local government elections, the electorates also have an apathy for the third year elections. A lot of Nigerians focus only on the presidential elections and House of Assembly elections. Because there are more money. There are more money there. They think there are more money there. They think there are more influence there. They think there is more visibility there. And they tend to forget the local government election. But let me tell you something. All that is changing. Because now there's a huge resources in the hand of uh, local government chairman. So it's going to be a bit of a do or die situation, you know. But this is when um, 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 the likes of Tough Africa, uh, Action Aid, and several other organizations in the electoral space, this is when we need to go in there and fix the problem. Start with the policy. My sister, you may not know, we've worked in four states. None of those states factored inclusivity in their local government election. And I can guarantee you, even Enugu that you just came back from, did not do anything about inclusivity. <laughs> you know? So, so and, and one of the that, things that I'm... Yeah, one of the things that I'm doing now is to push my community to go and contest election. Because leadership is bottom top. You don't emerge as a leader and just be at the top. Lead yeah. the national go to the sub-national, if we can emerge as councillors, if we can emerge as local government chairman and grow our leadership skills, tomorrow we can get into the state assembly, we can get into the uh, national assembly, we can try the presidency. You know, I don't believe in just anointing the unqualified just because he, he has a name or, or, or he's interested in a position. This thing is not about position, it's about purpose. What purpose are you going to serve going there? You know, and, and, and so that's why we need the likes of Action Aids. When you're pushing for all of this uh, intervention, please carry persons with disability along. The hope we have is that if we are able to make an entry in this uh, local government space, we will make greater entry at the, uh, at the, uh, um, at the state level as well yeah. as the national level. I'm sick and tired of all the flash in the pan we do in Abuja, everybody, blah, 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 blah. Meanwhile, we have greater work to do in the locality. Local, local government. Yeah. That's why I must praise Action Aid. Action Aid is people-oriented. They, they are driven to, to people. But oftentimes, 
please do not forget persons with disability. Well, so thank you very much, Jake, Ambassador um, Jake. Important Ms. I Judith. mentioned this. Um, so why you had a bit of network glitch, I had mentioned to Bito about um, on our new CSP, the country strategy paper, um, the priority three, we're looking at good governance, equitable assets. And you wouldn't believe that the first indicator we're looking at is actually the percentage of women young people and persons with disability who have reported that their voices are heard in politics and good governance Ms. and Judith, not just that i'll cut you there i have to cut you there okay. much like ambassador <laughs> jake has said please please call call me my sister call me if you i'm sure you have my number but i don't have yours call me we need yes to i do have your number I'll and we'll you call you both of you back <laughs> for a two-part discussion on this so that we can have more time to accommodate these issues you've raised but i must say thank you to the both of you for joining the program this morning. We appreciate you. Anytime. All right, thank you. Thank you, thank Ambassador. You.